So, good evening. I'm Frank LaFerla. I am the Dean of the Francisco J. Ayala School of Biological Sciences, and welcome to the Barclay Theater. It is a, a great honor for the Ayala School to partner with the Center for the Neurobiology and Learning and Memory and the Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders to put on this truly spectacular lecture series. Um, I'd like to point out that this is the 22nd annual Distinguished Lecture Series on the Brain, Learning, and Memory. And this actually started as the brainchild of Dr. James McGall. So perhaps we could give him a round of applause for having that foresight. <clears throat> also want to acknowledge my great partners in crime, uh, Dr. John Gazowski and Andrea Tenner from, of uh, the CNLM and UCI Mind. They're the directors of those institutes. Uh, and it's great to partner with them to put on this truly uh, fantastic lecture series. In my humble opinion, I think this represents one of the best public outreaches that uh, this university does. And for me personally, I'm very uh, moved by a quote from uh, famous astronomer Carl Sagan. And he uh, once said that we live in a society that's exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. And so it's so uh, gratifying for us to be able to put on this kind of lecture series. So I think since we may have last met, the US News and World Rankings came out. And it turns out that UCI was recently rated as the ninth best public university in America. And we tied with UC San Diego. And so that's particularly exciting because, as you know, one of our uh, important missions here is to create new knowledge. And certainly one fun aspect of creating that new knowledge is to be able to disseminate that knowledge to the community. And this is very important because many of you probably know that cognitive stimulation and learning is one of the best ways in which you can uh, perhaps prevent uh, dementia, and as we'll find out tonight, uh, exercise is as well. So how many in this, how many people in this room exercise on a regular basis? And how many people feel as though they don't exercise enough? It's just about everybody else. <laughs> so we all appreciate how important exercise is, and we're so fortunate tonight to have a truly outstanding uh, speaker. So my job tonight is to uh, introduce Dr. Carl Kottman, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. And I just want to uh, give you a little bit of background uh, about Dr. Kottman. Um, he is a distinguished neuroscientist who essentially single-handedly created the Alzheimer's Disease Center here. He was the founding director of what is now known as uh, UCI Mind. And we are very fortunate because of his vision, we are one of 29 uh, federally funded Alzheimer's centers in the nation. And we are Orange County's only federal and state funded Alzheimer's disease research and clinical center. And it's because of the vision that Carl has had. Uh, throughout his very distinguished career, he's been an incredibly prolific scholar, uh, having authored close to 800 uh, manuscripts. Uh, and if you uh, do the math, you could figure out that that is a high number of manuscripts uh, per year. He's won many, many distinguished awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Alzheimer's Association, and um, also the UCI medal. As many of you know, it's UCI's highest um, honor that we bestow. Uh, and you could also blame him for recruiting me to Irvine back in 1995. So let, please join me in welcoming Carl Kottman. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, it's indeed, um, I, I'm very proud of how UCI has moved along from a humble uh, buffalo pasture, frankly, 
to a major university, number nine, and probably going to keep going. So <clears throat> we all work together at this, and um, that's part of what's fun about Irvine. So tonight, it's my distinct honor to introduce to you Laura Baker, <clears throat> who will um, uh, talk to us about exercise for the brain, is it worth the sweat? Um, <clears throat> it's been said that sitting is the new smoking. And even though this audience is, uh, is pretty uh, active all the way around, it's <clears throat> been reported in a recent review that um, physical inactivity, which is typical of about 40% of this nation, is the biggest modifiable risk factor for cognitive decline. So what can we do about that? Well, you know, obviously get moving and you know, encourage people to do that. But part of it is the knowledge of what exercise is capable of doing to the brain and how it can actually transform it to keep it healthy and even make it stronger. Um, <clears throat> Laura, is a, Laura Baker is a pioneer in research on uh, effective exercise, on cognition and cognitive decline. She did the first placebo-controlled clinical trial to demonstrate an impact of exercise on people with mild cognitive impairment and has continued to be a pioneer in the field. She's currently at Wake Forest um, <clears throat> Medical School at Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where she joined the faculty there as associate professor in 2012, coming from the University of Washington, Seattle. <clears throat> At a personal level, um, Laura is an uh, up, aspiring, up-and-coming painter, a gardener, and a cyclist. Um, not necessarily of that order, either. <clears throat> um, she ha also has two parrots, which is a little tidbit that I just learned, uh, you know, this evening. Um, <clears throat> she's known for thinking outside the box. And in behavioral studies, it's really challenging to manage all the variables and to um, really keep control of the situation because it's not like a pull pill where you give it to a person and that's it. The person has to be uh, standardized and monitored and so on and so forth. And some days I could just imagine she comes home from work at night and says to her parents, 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 could you... Can you imagine what happened today? It even beats the last day. And what do you think I should do about this? And they say back to her, give him a cracker. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura is known for collaborative spirit, uh, being uh, able to reward people for what they do, and is most generous on, pri uh, on praising people's efforts. I've been honored to be able to co-lead a national exercise trial with her on people with mild cognitive impairment, where Irvine will be one of the participants and we'll be recruiting, uh, you know, starting actually in May. So keep in mind for alerts and so on, and we'd be honored to have some of you involved in it. So <clears throat> without further uh, delay, let's get to hear about Laura and how exercise can impact the brain. Thank you, Carl. Uh, am I on? Okay, I'm on. Um, actually, my parrots, let's be very clear, it sounded like I had two parents. <laughs> my parents say, when I do come home with my trials and tribulations of the day, they say, this is the only thing they know how to say, what's up? <laughs> That's all they know. So <clears throat> that works for me. So I'm just honored to be here today with this room filled with healthy people who want, are here to learn something new uh, about an age-old topic, right? We've been talking about exercise probably as long as you've been alive. Um, it's, a, it's a regular conversation. So what I want to do, though, is maybe take it to the next level in your thinking. So is exercise, why do I do this? Is it just good for the body? Might it be good for the brain? Is it worth the trouble, the sweat? I leave that to you to decide. So, as I said, this is a conversation uh, that we have. How many people have had a conversation about exercise within the last 48 hours? Not counting the conversation, okay, 
You see, this is, this is a standard conversation in all of our circles. So why do we care about it? Why are we studying this? Well, there's a few things that have changed in the last 50 years. Have you noticed anything that's changed in our culture? We don't do the same things we used to do 50 years ago. We've changed what we do and how we spend our time. Our children do this and more. We don't move. We come home from school and we watch TV. Anybody up in the top have any college kids, sorry, college students? Do you find yourselves more sedentary? Yes, a bit, okay. We changed what we do. We sit more often than we used to 50 years ago. And we use our leisure activities in a way that promotes sedentary behavior. Um, you've all probably noticed at the grocery store or the mall where people will circle and circle and circle to find the parking space that's three slots closer to the front door, <laughs> right? And I, I'm actually, I'm guilty of this until I catch myself, what are you doing here? Uh, but we've changed what we do. And we cha we've changed how we live. So I took this picture out of the plane yesterday. This is your space. We are victims of urban sprawl. And this is not, you know, this is not your um, burden to bear. This is nationwide in the United States and in other places as well. Uh, we are all spread out. We cannot mobilize from one location anymore by, by walking. We, have to, we can't ride bikes. We have to get in a car in order to go everywhere. And this is in stark contrast to the other side of the world in Denmark. That's Denmark, uh, where the most common mode of transportation is on a bicycle. Um, the urban, the, this urban sprawl does not characterize Denmark, so they're able to mobilize from one place to another using body. And Interestingly, this does not change in the winter. This, is a, uh, this person is all dressed up in their uh, work clothes, and it is snowing on this person. And when is the last time you've seen that? I know you won't see it in this county, but when is the last time you see, this is not a person dressed up in biking gear. This is a person dressed up for work. Uh, the title of this picture, I found it online, was Biking in Heels. <laughs> so... That, I think this is, hopefully presents the stark contrast between our cultures. But these changes in what we do and where we live have affected what we've become. And this, the, you know, the common ingredient is what is happening to the way we move? What's happening to what our bodies were meant to do? So what I'm showing you here is a graph of the total amount of exercise, I'm going to read it off for you because it's hard to see, but amount of many, number of minutes of moderate exercise for all adults, 20 to age 79, and then it breaks it down to younger, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and 60 to 79. And so the, the, um, the Center for Disease Control suggests that we get all get at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. Breathing, elevated breathing, heart rates get, is, is worked up a little bit, it's 150 minutes. Now this is out of about 100 hours a week that we're all awake. Okay, I'm giving everybody eight hours to sleep. So what this graph is showing is that uh, for our 20 to 39 year olds, on average, we get about 33, uh, this is men in, uh, men in the blue, women in the pink, how predictable. Um, so we get about thir uh, 33 minutes of, for men in that age group per week, 24, uh, sorry, this is per day, 33 per day, 24 for women in the early. By the time we're in our 60s to 80s, we're, up, we're down to about 15 minutes, um, 15 minutes a day of any activity at all. So uh, this is, sorry, this, this is... Sorry, this is weekly. 15 was sounding way too good for me. No, this is, these numbers are, what I'm showing you here is on average, older adults, and I'm talking about 60 to 79, get 15 minutes a week, a week out of 100 waking hours. So this is not, you know, characterize any single adult in the room. This is our culture. This is where we're going.
This is what concerns us as scientists. If we were meant to move, what, is this, what are the consequences of us not moving? And we are just at the iceberg, uh, the tip of the iceberg. This has been, these changes mark the, the significant alterations in the last 20 to 30 years. What about 20 years from now, when we don't move at all? Where are we going to be? So exercise, um, because we are, we are exercising so infrequently, um, it makes us wonder, what, is, what, is, what are we missing? What is exercise doing for us that we are no longer reaping the benefits of? Well, exercise has significant, as we all know, this is the old information that we all know. Sig exercise, of course, helps the heart. Exercise has Im uh, positive effects on the blood vessels, keeping them clean, keeping your cholesterol levels low, keeping the cell walls healthy so you can get good exchange of information. Exercise lowers your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Exercise lowers your risk of obesity. The list goes on. Exercise reduces stress and improves your mood. And if you've ever had any bout of exercise, you've at least experienced that directly. But in brain science, uh, we also study what exercise might be doing for the brain. We know from elegant animal work um, that exercise promotes brand new connections between cells in the brain. Exercise uh, protects brain cells from injury and early death. And we have new evidence coming out in the last few years showing that exercise may prevent or slow Alzheimer's disease. Now, any one of these, if we have core, uh, heart disease, if you have vascular disease, high cholesterol, if you have type 2 diabetes, if you are, have obesity, if you are stressed, depressed, any one of these can accelerate aging. If you have a disease of the brain that impacts your memory and thinking, thinking abilities, this is accelerated aging. It has the consequences of accelerated aging. So any one of these um, components that can be benefit, have received benefits with exercise if they are compromised can accelerate uh, your, the, 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 how quickly you age. So if this is true, might it be the case that exercise can slow aging, not just for the body, but for the mind? And I like this picture because it gives you a good uh, visual uh, representation of the potential change, the impact of exercise uh, in, a visual, in a visual form of the, the power and the potency of exercise to reverse some aging-related effects. So as we age, uh, there is most certainly change to brain structure and function. There are changes that happen as we all get, get older, normal changes that happen with age. We can't escape them. But there are also changes that happen in the brain with the onset of a disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. So just for, for my information, how many people in here, just raise your hand, how many people have been touched in some way by Alzheimer's disease? Not personally, but you know somebody, you have a family member. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at about half the room. Half the room has been touched. In five years, that number will increase by 50%. In five years, three quarters of this room, if I were to ask the same question, will raise your hand. In another 20 years, everyone in this room will raise your hand. We will all be touched by Alzheimer's disease at one point in our lives. Um, so here I'm just showing you a, just a, a visual demonstration of a health of the brain, and this is a person who would be looking directly out at you. And you could see it's nice and plump in the dark areas, a small and compare this to our 80-year-old person with memory loss, where if you knew nothing about brain anatomy at all, you could see that the dark spaces are much larger. And whenever you see dark spaces larger in a brain such as this, you, f you have atrophy or brain cell loss. And so this is just a tragic shift from a normal healthy brain to one with severe loss of cells. It affects the person experience of life 
Um, and if you've had, and for those of you who have had contact with Alzheimer's disease, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I wanted just to make sure that we're all on the same page about Alzheimer's disease because this does have relevance for why this, why this intervention we want to try is so needed, timely, and important. So uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it, clinically, you present with a memory problem. Um, you also present with other problems with thinking, uh, thinking skills. Uh, these people with Alzheimer's disease, by definition, must have some inability to carry out their activities at home, carrying out the tasks that we all do without thinking, cooking, driving, um, uh, working with finances, and so forth. And by definition, Alzheimer's disease is progressive. It does not start and stall. It continues. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is marked by a, a tragic loss of cells, and I showed you that earlier, but here's an even more uh, remarkable demonstration. These two people are both 76 years old at death. They're at the same age. So one developed, one developed the disease, one did not. And again, you, you already know enough to know that when you're seeing more spaces like this, this is, this is a severe atrophy. The person with this kind of a brain is unable entirely to take care of him, him or herself. And what we also see with Alzheimer's disease is we see the development of a characteristic pathological cell type in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. Everybody heard of the plaques and tangles? If you haven't, put it in your vocabulary. You're going to hear more about it. The plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease are characteristic cell types found under a microscope um, in the brains of an Alzheimer's patient. And they look very different under the microscope. The plaque is like a big um, uh, ball here, and the tangles are, are this more cylindrical shape. Uh, both of them interfere with normal cell function in the brain. When we see these cell types in the brain um, of a person, we, we feel confident that this person has, uh, is showing Alzheimer's disease and, and as shown by their pathology that's evident in the brain. What's, what's uh, scary but also provides a large window for prevention is the fact that these changes, both the clinical symptoms, the memory changes, the, uh, the changes to structure and function of the brain and the pathology, they start to occur long before it becomes, the symptoms become apparent in a doctor's office. Even as much as 10, 15, or 20 years. So this should be no surprise if you know anything about disease, right? Chronic diseases. Let's, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page, if we're talking about cancer, does cancer emerge the moment it's diagnosed in the doctor's office? No. It's been going on for a long, oftentimes a long period of time before it becomes evident to any tool that we have in a doctor's office. There is nothing different about Alzheimer's disease. It starts to occur long before it's noticed. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the scary news is there is some new evidence to suggest that this Alzheimer pathology, that means the brain changes here that I'm showing you, could, be, be, could begin as early as in a person's 40s. So this kind of makes us very pressured um, as scientists and clinicians to identify treatments that can stall or prevent this disease altogether and to, institute, and to implement these interventions ultimately early. So one day my message will be to you in the top row, if you are in your 20s, it's time to start your intervention. That's where we will be one day. So what do we do about this? We have a large number of our people that we love uh, who are continuing to progress and develop these devastating memory changes that, t that rob them of who they are. How do we stop it? How do we slow it down? Unfortunately, we have no drugs. There is not a single drug on the market that can slow or prevent this disease. We have drugs that can uh, keep it stable for a short period of time, and it works for some people. But we do not have an effective pharmacological intervention yet, which brings us back to this intervention that had these multiple benefits 
for not only the body, the heart, the blood vessels, diabetes, obesity, stress and mood, but also the brain. It has multiple targets in the brain that it can help to restore. Why aren't we looking at exercise as a possible intervention to slow or prevent disease? So, so far, uh, there have been some new, so this is, this is what e everyone has kind of locked onto this connection and why aren't we looking at this potent intervention that has multiple ben uh, health restoring effects in the body and the brain. So there have been a number of studies that uh, so far that have shown in animals, there is when you exercise animals, you see powerful, powerful, clearly evident effects, positive effects on brain structure and function. It's amazing. Uh, it's pretty easy to get animals to exercise, though, these kinds of animals anyway. I work with uh, rhesus monkeys uh, sometimes at, at Wake Forest in Winston-Salem. Let me tell you, they do not like to exercise. And you cannot get them to exercise, so we give up. Uh, rodents, we can, I think, Carl, right, we can get rodents to exercise pretty easily. So not only in, do animal studies show benefits, but in humans. There's new human studies that are starting to emerge, unfold one by one to say, hey, yes, pay attention. This is real. There may be something here. We need to figure this out, but we don't know the answer yet. But there's a weak signal to suggest it might work. So in humans, we're starting to see um, improvements because of exercise on memory and thinking skills in healthy older adults, people who are aging normally. But even more important for us who are trying to find a treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease or on the way to Alzheimer's dementia, exercise is a signal that it may help people who have a mild memory impairment and who are on their way to developing dementia. That would be huge. All right, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides and I'll orient you to. I, I like seeing these because then it, I think it will, I think when you, when the day is done, I'm hoping these pictures will stay in your head. So what I'm going to show you here, these are three perspectives of a single brain. And it's just like an average. Think about it as an average. And the hot spots, the colors, just indicate areas of growth in the brain. Brain volume increases. So what this study here was one where they uh, took healthy, older, sedentary adults, and they exercised them for six months. That's it. Six months. And you were either in the aerobic exercise group or a stretching group. And then at the end, they compared the brain pictures after the, after the intervention to the brain pictures before the intervention. They basically subtracted them. And what they found were that these areas, these spots on the brain, this is the underside of the brain, this is the top part of the brain, and this is the side. These areas were all areas that got larger in volume for the aerobic exercise group. All right, so let me, this, let me point out a couple of things. These people were sedentary. Okay, that note to file, never too late to start, right? Sedentary, I think 68 was the average age. No drugs on board, only exercise. Wow, that, that's pretty impressive that you can get change in, in, in brain volume connections um, uh, with exercise, a non-pharmacological intervention. Um, and it happened in six months. All right, the next picture I have to show you is one that doesn't focus on structure, but activity. So we, the brain must be active in order to get a product, right? We, we can't just have a volume up there. It has to be doing something. So here's, a, here's an example of one, uh, uh, this, this mean brain again, this, this average brain. And what we're seeing here is the activity before and after an exercise study in participants who have... Mild cognitive impairment. And so mild cognitive impairment is kind of the gray zone between normal, normal aging, and someone with Alzheimer's dementia. It is the gray zone that they have a high likelihood of progressing. So this is uh, the my, people with mild cognitive impairment were very interested in that window. It is an opportunity for prevention. When the signs are still subtle, there's no dementia, they're still able to get from point A to point B like all of us, they have more difficulty doing it. 
These are the people that was our primary focus for these intervention trials. In this particular group, the yellow spot right there indicates reduced activity, lower, it's a lower, than, lower than normal activity. So this is before the exercise intervention, this is after. That reduction in activity went away. It was restored, activity was restored in those following the exercise. Um, and this again was a six month intervention. So we have changes in structure and in function. And this is the structure changes were in healthy older adults. The change in function were in people who are at high risk of developing dementia. All right, so I get this question all the time. I, I, I tell, I'm telling you what some of the studies are coming out, but every time, if you read the paper, try to keep up with the Google, Internet, exercise, brain, whatever your, you know, the new news that's coming to you all the day, it, I'm sure it's a, it's a complex picture. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Does it work? Does it not? How much? What do I do? This is, we're constantly being barraged by different research results coming out. And I just wanted to spend a moment talking about it because now that you've been to this lecture, it is now your responsibility to help other people understand what, what, how to interpret these results. So some studies say there's a benefit, some studies say they don't. Why? First, when, if I were to go around the room and ask each one of you, do, do you exercise? What does that mean? What does exercise mean? What does exercise mean? What does exercise mean? I would get as many people as I ask, I would get that many answers, right? It all means something different to each of us. Um, and th kind of things, kind of different answers is that I would get a, what kind of exercise? Is it aerobic? Is it resistance? Is it yoga? Is it swimming? Is it tennis? How often are you doing it? How hard are you working? These are all the different types of exercise that need to be considered whenever we talk about it. But when you read about results or a study is conducted, these things vary from study to study. Yet all that's reported is exercise did not improve memory and thinking. But you, don't, you haven't heard about what kind of exercise, how often, and how hard are they working. So the details of exercise have everything to do about whether it works or not. For me, dose is a critical ingredient. So you can think about exercise as medicine. I know there's a great initiative at UCI now to promote exercise as medicine for the whole body, um, including the brain. But for any medication that you might be taking, dose is everything as to whether it's going to be effective or not. So why would it be any different for exercise? So if these studies that talk about exercise is not working, what is the dose? Have they achieved the, op the, the optimal dose to get the maximum benefit? These are the questions that you need to ask now. When you're, when you're hearing this, you know, discordant information about exercise, ask the question, how much? How hard? What was it? What's the dose? Did they achieve what they wanted to do in order to test whether it really can change brain function? So one new uh, evolution of our intervention strategies is to quit looking at one option for a treatment. Not one drug, not one strategy, but let's think about all of many, many different kinds of contributions. So what I'm showing you here is if we were to look at your, this, your risks and your protections that might protect or put you at higher risk of dementia, your risks might include alcohol misuse, hypertension, obesity, um, uh, diabetes, vascular problems, uh, brain damage, uh, brain cell damage, your diet, uh, your cholesterols are, are off. Any one of these increase your risk for cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. But there we have some other protections, physical activity, cognitive and social activity, education, all of these might protect against, the, against your cognitive decline. So one new strategy is to try to start combining different protective factors and controlling your risks as one type of intervention, all at the same time. That sounds, makes perfect sense to me. So there was one, I just wanted to tell you about this one study that was uh, finished not too long ago called the FINGER study, done, uh, completed in Finland. 
um, where they looked at not any one of these. They didn't look just at diet, just at exercise, just at cognitive training, or just at medical management of all their medical comorbidities. They looked at all of them as a composite. The people who were randomized to this arm got intervention on all of these to see if we'd manage all of these protections and risks. Can we change the trajectory? Can we slow cognitive decline? And what, the reason this is exciting is it just opens up a whole new window of quit being, for us as scientists, quit I thinking there's one bullet, one silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. We need to think more complex. We need to think about human behavior. What can we do to manage the risks and protections to reduce their risk for cognitive decline? What they found is after two years of this combined intervention, relative to a group that had only education about this information. After two years of treatment, the older adults um, who were at high risk for progressing to, to memory, to, to, to dementia, these people who are, we, they had identified a group of people who were, um, had mild cognitive impairment or had other risk factors that uh, put them at higher risk for progression. For these people who in, uh, participated in all of in this kind of an intervention after two years they saw a change in their memory and thinking skills there has been no other drug trial so far that has shown that and so it just has opened the door to um, help us understand why um, how to, to how to introduce new treatments that might have a bigger impact and for me this means with all of these different interventions are we increasing the dose of our intervention? Are we increasing the impact of our intervention by including all of them? Maybe only then do we see a difference. So I wanted to uh, talk, to finish up today telling you a little bit about some recent findings that we uh, have in a study that we completed not too long ago. Uh, this study was completed in Seattle uh, when I was there and, and then now in Winston-Salem. And this was a study to examine whether high dose Again, my focus on dose, high dose aerobic exercise uh, can improve brain health in people who are at highest risk of developing dementia. And I, you know, this study is the rationale for the study is based on all that we know about exercise and the, and the benefits both on the body and the brain. So in this study we called the PACE study, we had 71 people. So that's, you know, in all contexts for research, 71 is pretty small. So we still, it was just, you know, a test. We need to do other work to make sure that this is going to stand in larger trials, but this gets us going. They were arranged uh, in age from 55 to 89 years old. Uh, they came to the clinic so that we could identify people who were in the gray zone. Remember, these are the people who are not normal. They're not dementia. They have mild cognitive impairment. These are at high risk for progressing to dementia. Then we randomized them uh, to an aerobic training or a stretching control group for six months. Um, and then we had various procedures. We do lumbar punctures every, on almost all of our participants. We've gotten very good at it. Um, it is uh, uh, many of our participants, just so you know, if you are asked to be, do a lumbar puncture, any, many of our participants ask, well, doc, tell me when you're finished. And we say, we finished five minutes ago. We are, the, our techniques are, are improving significantly. And the reason this is important, this lumbar puncture, is the lumbar puncture allows us to test the fluid that bathes your brain to see what change we're making in your brain. If all we can do is look in your blood, we can't see directly what's going on, more directly what's going on in your brain. And I like to uh, liken this to, if I can, if you allow me to dig through your recycling at home, it'd be a little strange for you to let me do that, but if you were to let me go through your recycling, I know what goes on in your house, right? Think about the fluid that we pull out from the lumbar puncture. It's the recycling of the brain. And that gives us a much better sense if, we, if our intervention is working. And so we also do brain imaging and, and cognitive testing. And so here's our intervention. So it's a six month, again. Um, we have people exercise 45 minutes a day, four times a week times six months. Um, both groups, both our control group and our, intervention, our exercise. We use the local YMCAs. Uh, we feel it's important to get people into the community and out of the hospital. 
Um, this, they, all, all of my people had a, had a personal trainer once a week, and then they had to exercise on their own three days a week. We have elaborate procedures to help them to record and document what they've done. You know that if you have to write it down, you do it, right? If you don't write it down, that's when we forget. So we had an incredibly high attendance. So, you know, exercise, these are sedentary people, I forgot to say. Never exercised, they're between 55 and 89, and you got them to come for six months at 91%? Personal trainer. We also, uh, we also help our, our participants gradually build up so they can build up confidence. By the end of six weeks, they love it. It takes us the full six weeks, but at the end of six weeks, we've, we've converted them for the most part. They, they keep coming without um, our constant nagging. So our two groups, you can't see my very uh, flexible uh, young lady there, but she uh, has her leg up on a sign there. But uh, this, so our two groups are a stretching control, stretching balance group um, and aerobic training. Uh, they get all of the same stimulation. We ask that they, they all sedentary to begin with. They all have to get out of their house. They all have to go to the Y. They all get trainers. They all get the same interaction with the staff. That's all, these are all very important elements. You may get better because you start getting more attention, and we didn't want that to be the difference between the groups. So the only difference between them is the actual activities they do. This is all the same. Is so the heart rate is much higher, of course, for the aerobic exercise group. We get them to about 70 to 80 percent of their max. And so for a 75-year-old, for example, that's about 132 beats per minute for 30 of the 45 minutes. It's doable if we do it nice and slow, and then your, your heart responds very, very easily. In the stretching group, we keep t uh, heart rate way low. They're still doing activities, but the, blood, the beats per minute is about less, is ne less than 90 on average. So they're there, moving, still motion and flow, but the heart is not working as hard. So the first finding I want to tell you about is what happened to memory and thinking skills. So executive function uh, is, one, is the type of memory and thinking skill. Um, it's got a memory component. Executive function is a type of cognitive ability that's been shown in the past to benefit from exercise. So what is executive function first? I've just listed some things here, but it is your ability to plan, initiate, multitask, your ability to, uh, so when you are, anytime you're planning, what am I going to do? When am I going to do it? How am I going to accomplish it? This is your executive function. It's your CEO. Uh, how, your ability to focus. Your ability, your ability to finish what you start. Your ability to do two things at once or multitask to the best of your ability. You get distracted, but you're able to pick it up again later. These are all your executive function is working well. So this is what we expected to change with exercise. This is what we found. So what I'm showing you here is this the aerobic group with the red bar, and this is the difference of baseline to month six. So uh, when the bar goes up, it says they improved. So the aerobic group improved in their ability to complete these kinds of tasks. The stretching group got worse. So what does this mean? Stretching is bad for you? No. So do you remember what the characteristics of these people? They have mild cognitive impairment. They are in the gray zone. These are the ones who are at high risk for progression to dementia. So these people continue to get worse, as you would expect. Um, but the exercise blocked that and actually um, uh, resulted in improvement. That's pretty astounding. Um, and if you are one, among the ones who feel like you are losing your ability to think clearly, this is a tremendous, this could be a tremendous change. So remember the lumbar puncture, the recycling? So we look in your recycling uh, from the brain, and in that fluid, we are always looking for markers of disease severity. And one of the uh, markers that I talked about earlier today was the plaques and the, and the tangles. And what we saw when we were looking, we didn't see any difference in the, in the plaques. Um, but we did see a difference in the tangle, the protein responsible for forming the tangles, this one here. And what we found is that for um, older adults, the adults over age 70 who were in the aerobic group, these protein associated with the tangles went down with exercise. 
So let me just orient you. We've got the stretching over here, the aerobic over here. The blue bars are the young ones. The red are the little bit, little tiny bit older, over 70. So what we see is that for, so what's interesting about this is for, the, you know, you might ask, well, why isn't that the less than 70-year-olds, why, why didn't their tau protein levels go down? But when we look at what the tau, pro, how, how high the levels are at baseline, these older than 70-year-olds, their tau protein levels are much higher at baseline to begin with. Higher protein levels in CSF corresponds with higher, more tangles in the brain, more, higher risk of tangles in the brain. So these 70-year-olds had higher levels at baseline. They had more room for improvement with exercise. Okay? Let me just tell you this, there has been no study so far with a medication that has shown a medication's ability to lower this protein that's, that, relate, that tells us about the pathology in the brain related to Alzheimer's disease. It's never, no drug to date has been able to show a decrease in this protein um, associated with progression of Alzheimer's disease. All right, what about the volume? of the brain. What about in this study? What did we see? So first what I'm going to show you is this is a, um, oh, you can't see my colors too well, but you can see the dark spots. This is a picture of three, uh, uh, at, this is our average brain again, okay, just you know, many brains summed together to get one picture. What I'm showing you here is these darker spots here, this is um, the, uh, here, here, and these little spots here. Not the, not the holes in the middle, but the spots in, on the brain tissue itself. These are areas that, that typically, as you um, progress from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment, gray zone, to dementia, uh, these areas start to shrink in these individuals. Those are the hot spots for shrinkage with the progression of disease. Okay? So what did we see when we had the ex in the exercise trial? So first, these areas that I've circled, where normally you see shrinkage with progression of disease, we saw expansion with exercise. And remember, again, six months, no drugs on board. We saw a expansion, growth, brain, brain volume growth in those areas that are classically atrophying with progression of disease. And the other part that I'm very, um, that we're very, uh, we find very promising is there's another area here that corresponds to your hippocampus on the right side. And the hippocampus, I know many of you know hippocampus, right? And its role in memory and thinking abilities. In the hippocampus, we oftentimes see with a progression of disease, that area shrinks. And that is one of the hardest hit areas with the progression of disease. What we saw in our study is that this shrinkage happened in the control group, but not in the exercise group. It's as if exercise protected against shrinkage in an area that's critical for you to remember how you got here. What happened? What happened? What did you have for dinner? How did you get here? Where's your car? What are you supposed to do later? This is key elements, this key memory impairments that are so classically related to development of Alzheimer's disease. All right, and then I'm, my last set of findings have to do with, we talked about cognition, biomarkers in the brain, um, the, in your recycling. We've talked about but, but, uh, the volume of the brain. The only thing we haven't talked about is blood flow, right? So blood flow, what changes did we see? So first off... We saw that in our aerobic group, overall, looking at the whole brain, blood flow was increased. Six months of exercise. Okay, but when we look at it a little closer, what I'm showing you here are the colors represent areas where flow increased for the aerobic exercise group. All right, so colors just mean different areas. That's it. So we see it in the red area, which is the frontal part of the, of the brain. The the blue area, the posterior parietal part of the brain, and the green, which is the cingulate area, just um, on either side. Okay? These are key um, areas that play a role in both normal aging. Uh, the aging changes that we see when, as you get older, uh, we all experience a decrease in blood flow in this red region. It's a normal consequence of aging. Sadly, it's true, though. It happens to all of us. 
This blue area is a hallmark area that we pay attention to when we're looking at the earliest changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. So when we're, these, this is the area where we first see decrease in blood flow with the onset and progression of Alzheimer's disease. We're seeing increases in both of those regions and as well as the region that connects the two. So this next picture is just simply showing you the right and left side to show you it's no difference. Right and left, you get the same benefit. Right and left side of the brain, that's good. And it's just showing you the um, actual, actual blood flow for the stretching group. Uh, I don't think that's a significant drop. It looks like it is, but it's not a statistically significant drop. So it looks like it's lower, but it's not low enough for us to say, wow, it's really decreased. It's not that way. But what is more remarkable is the difference between them. These people were the same at the entrance to the, exam to the study. And that's, why you, that's why randomization is so important. Everybody's the same coming in so that when you do something differently to the two groups and they differ, you know it's because of what you've done, not because of some pre-existing criteria. And by looking at this, you, you have to ask yourself, wow, what was different about these people when they went into the study? But remember, there was nothing different about them. All right, so my, so the last thing I'm going to show you here is this, this, um, this is a picture showing an area of the brain. This is what I've already told you, but I thought I'd show you a picture anyway, where this region right here on the frontal part, is, remember the red region you just saw? This is the area where it marks the location of normal aging-related reductions in blood flow. This is exactly where we saw the increase in response to exercise. And then this blue region... Again, this is, this, is in, this is data from other people, not from us. These are other people showing that this area is first reduced in blood flow for older adults, and this area is first reduced with the early onset of, an, of, of a dementing disorder like Alzheimer's disease. And these are exactly the same two areas where we saw an increase in flow. So I leave you with a summary of what we've seen. Um, we have seen some information showing that maybe blood brain volume in healthy older adults might increase. The activity of it increases in response to exercise in people with mild cognitive impairment. Cognition improves in response to the six-month intervention. The biomarkers in cerebral spinal fluid in your recycling also was beneficial response to exercise. We saw an increase in blood flow and a change in volume in the areas that are classically reduced in volume as the disease progresses. progresses. So I will let you answer the question <laughs> about whether it is worth your sweat. Um, the, I, Carl had mentioned a moment ago that we are uh, in the process of, of conducting a large-scale definitive trial nationally to determine whether exercise, high-intensity exercise, aerobic, can actually slow disease, that it might be a therapy, a, a prescription that you receive at your doctor's. That one day, a person with memory problem may go to the doctor, and their prescription is written for a, a very specific exercise program, hopefully that will be covered by our health care. Um, that is where we're going. And there will be a program in place at our local YMCA's that can handle this. So what I, I think I, it's important to say to this group is that we only have 14 sites across the United States who can participate. Only 14. This study is very complicated, so we're reducing our numbers. UCI, or Orange County, is one of those 13 sites. So this is really an important opportunity for this city, and it's just, uh, important that this city will play a role in the results of this hallmark trial uh, of exercise. Um, this incredible resources here and the community spirit is going to be uh, just what we need to help support this trial. So um, with that, um, I will finish. I would like to just... You always need to thank the people who actually do all the work and support you all along the way. And uh, Wake Forest has been fabulous. Uh, University of Washington has been fabulous. Um, my relationship and work with Dr. Kotman um, has been the highlight of my life. Um, and he uh, hoped that doesn't end until the, the end of this study and longer. <laughs> Um, and then we, this trial, this big excerpt trial that we're, that we're conducting will be coordinated uh, by UCSD. 
But um, so this, California has a role, um, but it's, it's, I, I just love the idea that um, UCI is the only California school, though, that will be participating in excerpt. So I'm very proud to be able to bring that to UCI. All right, thank you. Okay, now we have no excuse not to exercise. So I uh, got to tell you this joke that Matab, where's Matab? Uh, she and I were on this program on Saturday and she showed this funny cartoon of a uh, patient who goes to see the doctor and tells the doctor that his busy schedule won't accommodate an hour of exercise a day. And the doctor replies, tell me what accommodates your schedule better, an hour of exercise a day or 24 hours of dead. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have time for a few questions, and we're going to have some graduate students, I think, that are going to be circulating around with uh, microphones so everyone can hear, and we will try to, uh, you know, be very uh, geographically, uh, you know, distributive in our questions here. So there's some uh, here, if we want to go in the front row. Diane, you want to start us off? Yes. Here's a mic. These results are really exciting, but how does it occur? Is the oxygen like making the brain cells stay alive or killing pathogens? What is the mechanism? So the, the, the mechanism, that is the, that is the you know, $1 million, probably $5 billion question for all the grant money that's going to be take to, to answer that question. There's a, many different ideas that we're entertaining. The, the short answer is we don't know yet. Okay, we don't know yet, but that's surely not going to stop us from studying. Uh, we have many different ideas that we're exploring having to do with genes, uh, exchange of nutrients through increased blood supply, uh, um, stimulatory activity that involves, that will help the, the neurons and the brain cells stay alive longer, and, and so what we call growth factors uh, that would uh, protect, help protect the brain against injury. Um, and then there are uh, other mechanisms that have to do with treating, you're treating other ailments of the body and brain, like cerebrovascular disease, you're changing how the vessels, the health of the vessel walls, and by fixing other medical uh, comorbidities, the downstream effect is that you're improving the cogn cognitive function and also protecting against the progression of disease. So short answer, we don't know. Long answer, we have a lot of ideas, and the very long uh, solution is that we hope to have these answers, and I think there's a lot of work going on. I'd say within 10 years, that seems like a long time to you probably, but that seems like nothing to me, but within 10 years, we should have a pretty good idea about what exactly is going on there. Okay. Who's Let's calling? Let's go over here on the right side. The question I have is how much exercise? You talk about exercise, exercise, yeah. One hour a year or 50 hours a week? <laughs> All right. So let, let me translate. How little can we get away with? <laughs> right? right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's the question we all really want to know is how little can we get away with? So my short answer is whatever you're doing now, do a little more. Wait, wait. Don't. I, I have to appease everyone in the audience. Not everyone is able to accomplish these goals. So... The short answer is move. We were meant to move. Carl mentioned that sitting is the, is the new smoking. Um, and I, I think the first point has got to be move. We need to increase our movement. How much is it going to take to turn up the dial? How much do we have to turn up the dial to protect the brain? This is what I think this study that we're doing, we will have some answers because in this study, we are regimenting. We want everybody to exercise this amount. Do you think we're going to get that from everybody? No, we will not. We will, there will be a, a gradation of people who accomplish some of the exercise and people who accomplish more of it. So from the results of that excerpt study, we will have a better idea. Right now, no one knows. We're still in proof of concept. We're still having to demonstrate exercise works. We're not ready yet to start talking about how little can you do? All I know is about what we study. I study four times a week, 45 minutes a day. I think you could get away with a little less, but I'm not willing to, I, I, I can't speak to it because I haven't studied it 
and, and others. That generally speaking, that it takes a good amount in order to se start seeing a difference. Okay, let's go up to the balcony. Sorry, I'll keep it shorter. Uh, hi. So I guess I'm also somewhat curious on the origins of just how the uh, exercise is somewhat um, exactly helping to prevent the deterioration of the um, cells within the brain. So you said you had some ideas, and I was considering, um, would this perhaps be more of an epigenetic um, form of preventing the deterioration? So through the use of perhaps, um, because of the fact that if adults that are grow older, eventually um, through the use of um, adapting, prevent the uh, production of the white brain matter because of the fact that they are finding little use for it, would it perhaps be due to exercise that, the, uh, um, that they are then activating the genome again in order to produce more white matter? Or is this perhaps because of the fact that telomeres are then being reduced, but eventually the telomeres are now being uh, regained through the use of exercise? No, no, I'm, 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 do you, I, I'm sorry, this is kind of hard to word, but do you someone understand what I'm trying to ask? I, I do understand. Um, <laughs> I, It was actually an impressive, uh, you, you, you just demonstrated an impressive amount of knowledge about, uh, no, I'm serious, you have. Um, so you are hitting on some topics that, we, that are being discovered. I mean, teleomeres is, is a big topic that, right now. We, we don't know. I mean, really, I, I wish I could elaborate, but we don't know. Epigenetics, absolutely. Uh, we, there is evolution uh, as, as a result of our exposures that we do need to take in consideration. My only comment that I would have you said when we don't need our white matter anymore when we're older, I would like beg to differ with you on that one. <laughs> I hope we always need our white matter. But I... I, uh, I, I'm, I think what, like, so, again, I was saying it was kind of hard to word, but rather the fact that we're not being introduced to new information and thus we're not creating new sort of uh, um, forms of storing that information, so to speak, right? Well, we never stop... Well, no, of course not. It's just that the information isn't necessarily as new. Um, but uh, thank you anyway. Okay. Thank you. Keep right. up the good work. Let's, let's go down here on the right. So let's go here on the right. Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, hello. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, very informative. I've got a wonky question, too. In the CSF, you're looking for biomarkers. Is it primarily the tau? Are you looking for beta amyloids as well, or is there some other bio biomarker? And then follow up, are any of these biomarkers uh, present in, in uh, blood, not just CSF? Okay, so biomarkers, um, we're, we're just, uh, I mean, we had 70 people, so we, we do need to do this. We need to take a look at these in a larger number of people. Absolutely, we're, look, we're interested in beta amyloid. Beta amyloid um, is got a, um, a different profile sometimes with, as it relates to progression of disease. So beta amyloid increases for a period of time, and then as your disease develops, it actually decreases. So we've got a U-shaped function, and you have to know exactly where you are on that U-shaped function in order to know what your beta amyloid means. Tau, that's not the case. Up is always worse. Down is always better. And so, in that sense, we are going to be looking at both. We, are, well, we have plans to look at, at other biomarkers having to do with inflammation. Um, we can get some of these in blood. Um, with respect to uh, the beta amyloid in particular, there's nothing like testing your beta amyloid in your recycling. Um, the blood just doesn't, there's a lot of controversy yet about what, how the blood biomarker relates to cerebral spinal fluid. So, better in CSF. So there are some biomarkers are actually better in blood, but... Tau is not one of them. Okay, let's take uh, two more questions. Were there any studies um, involving weight training as opposed to aerobic exercise? And then also, I was having difficulty following the graphs, and I got the impression that stretching was a very little value. Is that, was that correct? Um, the stretch, in terms of uh, any of our outcomes, yeah, we, we didn't see a benefit on any of our outcomes of, of the stretching. Okay. Um, I'm not, we are not looking at physical function. Uh, these people are also much able to, much better, can get up off the floor much easier, can drive much easier. They're turning, they're not falling, their gait is better. I mean, they had a lot of physical function benefits. It's just not showing up on the outcomes that we were interested in. And what was your other question? Uh, were there any studies uh, involving oh, the weight training. Re resistance you know, training? There, there are a number of weight training studies that are being, uh, they're, they're, it's being investigated now. Um, I, I, 
I, I don't have the sense that weight training alone is showing in, in, in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease, there's no evidence to suggest that that's a, that's a primary modality of exercise that could be efficacious. Thank you. Okay, let's take one more question over here on the left-hand side. I was just going to ask the same, something similar. Where would yoga come into something like this? Then? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, no I, I agree that, you know, in, in any, you know, real-life intervention for, for physical activity, you know, a, a diverse portfolio of activities is likely going to be most beneficial, which would include resistance training, aerobic, yoga. But in this particular study, uh, we are trying to specific. We were trying to specifically ask whether improved cardiorespiratory fitness, in particular, benefited brain function. If we start combining yoga with that, when we get a benefit, which one was it? And so I, I think I have no problem. I, I absolutely would not disagree that the, there's many benefits to yoga that have to do with, you know, physical function, but also stress levels. I just don't know, uh, I don't have any data to tell you whether there is value in prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, uh, I have a couple quick announcements before we close out. Uh, I hope you found this as informative as I did. And if you look at the back of your brochure, <laughs> If you look at the uh, back of your brochure, you'll see that there are a lot of upcoming events. I hope you'll consider attending some of those. And I'd just like to point out, you probably heard me mention this before, that we're kind of like PBS here, and we depend on viewers like you to help support not only these great lecture series, but also to help advance science. So we need everyone in this room to play an important role, and all of us could either uh, advocate, participate, or donate. And that's the only way that we are going to be able to solve some of these complex challenges that are facing our society. So we have some information booths in the back. And uh, we have a reception. And Dr. Baker will be here to answer some questions. And in the meantime, we have a special gift for her to show her uh, our appreciation. And for those of you who are curious, the post office came out with a limited edition stamp on Alzheimer's disease, and it's, we thought it was a great way to commemorate this wonderful lecture. So please join us in the reception, and let's give Dr. Baker another round of applause.